Okay, good morning everyone. I'm going to get started. There are still folks entering the webinar, but we have a pretty full agenda, so I wanted to get started. So welcome. Um, welcome to the webinar, Integrating New Arrivals in the Workplace. Next slide, please. My name is Carrie Thomas, and I'm with the Illinois Department of Employment Security. Um, following this introduction and overview, we'll be joined today by Jeroen Schwartz and Sarah Fountain from the Tent Partnership for Refugees. They'll provide some insight and expertise and strategies for employer-based hiring solutions um, and hiring programs for refugees and new arrivals. Following their presentation, we'll hear from Victor Vizueta from the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership, who will talk about how the partnership is working to assist employers and new arrivals to connect in the Chicago area, where there has been a great number of individuals arriving over the past year. And we will close with a question and answer period. I also want to mention that integral to today's webinar has been the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, whose Office of Employment and Training team has been leading the state's workforce efforts related to new arrivals, coordinating all of us partners, as well as coordinating with the Illinois Department of Human Services and the governor's office. Next slide, please. So a couple of reminders about the purpose today and some logistics. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide information and resources to employers and those that work with them on how to best work with the workforce system to connect to new arrivals looking for work, as well as to gain insights into the unique challenges you may need to consider in the hiring process. On the logistics side, we are recording this webinar and it will be shared with everyone through a follow-up email that will include all of the slides. There are several links in the slides. Participants are all muted for the webinar, but please use the chat for your questions. We will try to get to as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. We also know that there will be more questions than we are able to answer today, and we commit to doing our best to get answers to those and provide it in a summary that is sent out to everyone who registered. Next slide, please. So to get us started, we just wanted to do a quick poll question for everybody who's on the webinar. You should see the poll question pop up in a minute. We want to know, does your organization help pay for support services, such as housing or childcare or something like that, for new arrivals that you hire? So if you just enter your answer, and then Amy or Kirsten, if you can show us the responses as soon as you think we have enough. We'll give everyone a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end that and share the results. All right. Thank you. It looks about like about 20% of the participants so far do provide some kind of support services. So we know that that's an important um, piece of the puzzle and um, we wanted to know at this point who was thinking about that or had some resources. Okay, we can go to the next slide. All right, I also thank you everybody who registered and filled out the registration questions. I wanted to kind of give a picture of who's on today's webinar. Um, so I think we have over 350 people registered for the webinar. Um, and of all the attendees today, um, not surprisingly, the majority are from the 10 county metro area, including over half from Cook County. Uh, but we do have um, a strong interest from um, 
outside of the metro area. So we do have the remainder of individuals are representing have services or work in over 20 other counties outside of the 10 county metro area. I will also mention that we have a range of types of organizations that are present are participating, so employers, business intermediaries like chambers of commerce, local workforce areas, community colleges, unions, and a wide range of community-based organizations, uh, workforce organizations, and other support organizations. <clears throat> a quick snapshot of the employers that we know are, had registered for today. So they represent over 20 different industries. The top three you see on the screen, not surprisingly, manufacturing is the top one. Um, they are a range of different sizes, the majority being under 1,000 employees, um, but there are some that are quite large. Um, it is worth noting that over 50%, so 54% um, said that they did have open positions right now that do not require strong English language skills. So thank you for everybody re responding to the per, um, registration questions. Um, and also people did provide us with questions that helped us uh, prepare for today and that we will be providing answers to either today on the webinar or in our follow-up communication. You can go to the next slide. So very quickly, I wanted to give a high level overview of how the Illinois workforce system facilitates employer-led solutions to the hiring needs through the American Job Centers in Illinois, also known as Illinois WorkNet Centers. Three areas that are really relevant to today's conversation are hiring strategies, training strategies, and English language services. But I do wanna be clear that that's not the only thing that um, the Illinois workforce system helps employers with. We help employers connect to hiring incentives. We help them with customized labor market information. There's a range of things. On the hiring side, um, for those of you who aren't aware, there is a free um, Ill, uh, job board that employers can put all their job postings in called Illinois Job Link. Um, there's also a virtual job fair system that employers can do recruiting through. And then of course, there's a range of ways that um, the Illinois workforce system through the American Job Centers helps with hiring events. Um, there's also a range of training solutions. And when Victor does his presentation, he'll be talking about how the partnership um, does those training solutions. And then of course, really important to the population we're talking about today, um, there's a range of English language services that can be accessed um, through the American Job Center system um, that are delivered by our partners um, through the community colleges, schools, and community-based organizations. Next slide, please. If you are not already connected to the public workforce system, the best way to get started is to find the American Job Center closest to you. Um, and there is a service finder on the Illinois WorkNet website that is linked here that you will get. Um, following um, when you get the webinar slides. Next slide, please. Any American Job Center can assist with hiring needs. And in Cook County, there are 10 American Job Centers. Um, and any of them can help with hiring needs um, of, for new arrivals. But in addition, um, we wanted to note that uh, six of the American job centers in Cook County have been designated as priority welcoming job centers. They are all listed here, um, including their locations and their phone numbers and links to their websites. So that's an important piece of information to have. You can go to the next slide, thanks. So to provide some context for today, we wanted to give some information about the state's efforts to assist new arrivals with their um, employment authorization and temporary protected status. So as many of you know, thousands of new arrivals have come to the Chicago region from the southern border of the United States. Some, but not all, are elig of these individuals are eligible to apply for temporary protected status, or TPS, as it's called, or work authorization. EAD is the acronym for Employment Authorization Determination and is frequently used interchangeably with work authorization. The state of Illinois, with the city of Chicago, Cook County, federal agencies, and many, many community organizations have been coordinating efforts to quickly help those who are eligible apply for both TPS and work authorization. 
The Illinois Department of Human Services is leading much of that work, and the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity is leading efforts with workforce partners to get people quickly connected to employment and, if needed, workforce services. This webinar is actually part of those efforts. Work authorization, or EAD, is a legal status for individuals who meet specific eligibility criteria, and not everyone is eligible. The Department of Human Services has put together an excellent FAQ on temporary protected status um, that we will share. I think um, we're going to share that in the chat right now. Um, and so that is a useful piece of reference material for everyone. Since the fall, the Department of Human Services has coordinated legal, legal workshops with legal aid providers and pro bono pro bono attorneys to facilitate it to facilitate an expedited application process for many new arrivals who are eligible. The first phase of that was to focus on those individuals who are living in temporary shelter. And as you can see from the chart on the right, they estimated that about 3,500 individuals would be eligible. Um, and to date, um, this data is from the end of January, I believe. Um, Close to 3,000 applications have been completed and submitted through that process, and over 1,200 individuals have already received work authorization, and many of those are already working with the public workforce system to find employment. The legal aid, these legal aid workshops are co-located with federal immigration authorities and workforce organizations so that federal checks and job search resources are provided simultaneously to the new arrivals. Uh, the folks um, at the workforce table, so the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership and others, have been pro both providing information to the new arrivals about how to access services, as well as collecting some basic information from them. I'm going to go through that in a minute. So now IDHS, uh, the Department of Human Services, is working with partners to focus on new arrivals who are living in community, who might be in rental assistance programs or living with family members, to find them who are eligible for TPS and EAD to help them with that application process. That, that is, of course, a more dispersed population, but these legal workshops will continue. You can go to the next slide. So I wanted to give um, some basic information that was collected from the interest forms. This information is current as of about three or four weeks ago, so Victor may be able to provide some more updated information. Um, but you can see that this is a highly motivated work-ready population. 71% of those who completed the interest form are between the ages of 25 and 45, and 92% are uh, between the ages of 18 and 45. About three quarters have completed at least high school in their home country, and about a quarter have some college or trade school. So employers will want to be thinking about opportunities for training and upskilling, or new skills, or figuring out transferable skills to um, jobs in the United States. Not on this slide, but I wanted to mention that we know that 91% of those who completed the interest form um, expressed in, um, interest in English language services. Um, and so some of them have already been connected to those services, but referrals to those kind of services can be made through the American Job Center and the workforce system. So employers should be thinking about that maybe jobs that don't require um, English language skills or significant English language skills and ways to possibly bring English language learning into the workplace. Finally, you'll see that individuals have worked in many different industries and close to 30% identified having worked in construction. So that's an overview of where we are now with the new arrivals. Um, but I do want to now turn this over to Yaron and Sarah from the Tent Partnership for Refugees. They are an inter with an international organization that mobilizes major businesses to connect refugees to work. Yaron. Thank you um, so much, Carrie. And it is great to um, be here with all of you today. Um, and thank you to the Illinois government for the opportunity to present. Um, my name is Jeroen Schwartz, um, I use he, him pronouns, um, and I am TENT's uh, director for the United States, overseeing the team that is helping companies hire, train, and, and mentor refugees throughout the country, um, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by my colleague Sarah um, as well, um, and we'll be presenting alongside one another. 
So if you could go to um, the next slide to complement um, the wonderful information that Carrie just shared um, in terms of what we want to discuss in today's presentation, we want to start off by telling you a little bit about TENT and who we are as an organization. We're then going to talk through best practices for how companies can implement a refugee hiring program, starting with how a company sets their internal strategy and develops a refugee recruitment pipeline. And then once you've actually hired a refugee, how do you create a welcoming environment for them as one of your employees? And how do you continue to um, drive impact? Um, and excited to answer any questions that folks have at the end as well. So let's dive right into it um, on the next slide. So in terms of a little bit about our background and history as an organization, the Tent Partnership for Refugees was started by the founder and CEO of Chobani, the food company, very much so based off of Chobani's own experience hiring hundreds of refugees at their plants in upstate New York and in Idaho. And our founder, Hamdi Ulakaya, having seen the contributions that refugees made to his own business and um, wanting other businesses to similarly step up to support this population, started Tent, as you can see on the next slide, in 2016 with the mission of mobilizing the business community to connect refugees to work worldwide. And while today's presentation is going to focus exclusively on the United States and really the opportunity um, in, in Illinois today, I do want to flag that we are a global organization that helps companies hire, train, and mentor refugees, both here in the United States, but also in the rest of North America, South America, and Europe um, as well. Next slide, please. Specifically um, here in the United States, as you'll see when they move to the next slide, thank you. Um, uh, you'll see that here in the U.S., we manage a um, coalition of over 200 major companies that are committed to hiring, training, and mentoring refugees um, across the country. In terms of um, the companies that are eligible to um, join TENT and benefit from our services, which we'll tell you more about, we work with any company that has over 2,000 employees globally, and that is purely due to our limited bandwidth um, as an organization to support companies that are able to support refugees um, at scale, but we'll make sure to highlight um, resources throughout this presentation that are publicly available for companies of any size. But as you can see from some of the logos on today's screen, we work with a range of, of large companies, anything from hospitality to retail to manufacturing to food processing, um, to healthcare, to many others, and have deep expertise supporting the business community in setting up um, refugee hiring programs. Next slide, please. And so in terms of the services that TENT offers for our member companies, we really provide them with guidance and resources to set up an effective refugee hiring program in a number of different ways. So the first thing that we do is that we help our member companies set the strategy for their um, refugee hiring program, advising them on uh, the locations and types of roles that uh, make the most amount of sense to prioritize for their refugee hiring efforts and making sure that companies, HR teams and talent acquisition teams feel like they have a very clear plan of how they're going to um, uh, kind of uh, focus on this issue area and effectively recruit from this talent pool. The, once we set that strategy, the next thing that we do is that we connect companies to local organizations and hiring events that can help them recruit refugee talent. And we'll highlight what some of those resources are specifically um, in the Chicago area on today's call. And then once we set the strategy and help companies set up that refugee recruitment pipeline, we then also train companies on best practices for refugee integration and thinking through how you need to tailor uh, your recruitment and application processes to welcome refugee talent. And then as refugees kind of grow at your business, thinking through how to overcome challenges like transportation and language barriers um, that refugees face when integrating um, into the workforce. And so um, we do, um, we support companies with this training through monthly calls for our member companies, through guidebooks that we'll highlight on today's call, as well as other resources that we develop. We don't charge anything for companies to join TENT or to receive access to our services. Everything that we do is free, and we're really just focused on motivating the business community to do more work on this issue and to make it as easy as possible for them to do so. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Sarah, um, which you'll see on the next slide, is going to start talking you through the process for how you can actually start um, implementing a refugee hiring program. Thanks, Yaron. Um, and why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, there are a number of reasons why we think it's important for companies to be intentional when it comes to set setting up a refugee hiring program and really acknowledging the many barriers that refugees face accessing work in the United States. 
Um, by being intentional about setting up these programs, there are a number of benefits that your company can see, including increased employee retention, um, benefits to consumer perceptions around your company's brand and reputation, and as well as um, to be able to attract uh, new talent for your overall uh, recruitment efforts for your company. Next slide. The first step in being able to set up these programs is to designate a lead for your refugee hiring program. We know that there are a number of people involved in recruitment efforts at your companies. Um, and so really this person's role will be to oversee the um, strategy and implementation of your refugee hiring program and make sure that you have the resources that you need um, to be able to successfully implement these. Generally, we see that um, the leads for these refugee hiring programs come from HR or DEI to be able to oversee these efforts. Um, but on occasion, we do see that um, we do, professionals are coming from CSR public policy backgrounds as well. So it really depends on your company structure and priorities, um, but this is generally the first step that we see companies take. Next slide. Once you've identified a lead for your refugee hiring program, the next step will be to define goals for your organization moving forward. We find that companies are successful in these efforts when they are able to set specific and measurable targets for the number of refugees that they're going to be hiring in Illinois or nationally. Um, and so to be able to form these goals, there are a number of different factors that you can look at to be able to effectively set these goals and drive success for your company. This includes um, the number of jobs that you do have available, um, first year attrition rates, what your recruitment pipeline looks like, and from there, you'll be able to understand how many refugees you think your organization will be able to hire, as well as understanding the landscape as well um, to be able to see how many refugees are arriving to that area. For those of you who do have over 2,000 employees and would like to join 10, um, we, we do provide direct support to our members to be able to understand and define realistic, yet ambitious goals to be able to drive the refugee hiring efforts. Um, so we'd be able to provide that support as well for large companies. Next slide. Next, you'll want to start educating your HR team on the different barriers that refugees face when it comes to accessing work and the ways that your company um, can help address these head on. We have a number of guidebooks that are available publicly. So this is for all companies um, on our resources page. I'm going to ask my colleague, Yaron, oh, looks like might already be in the chat um, to put our public resources. And these will include um, some useful tools, some case studies and best practices from companies that have been hiring refugees for a long time about ways that you can educate your HR teams on these different challenges as well. Next slide. And as you're communicating to your HR teams, it's also gonna be important to communicate with your stakeholders that you're taking on this incredible work. Um, so internally, it's a great idea to be able to spotlight this work through um, employee newsletters, internal messaging structures like Slack or Microsoft Teams, and really promote these efforts um, during your team meetings. We find that when companies have multiple departments that have an awareness and are really excited to drive these efforts forward, it can make a big difference when it comes to championing um, starting a refugee hiring program and getting it off the ground. Externally, there are also a number of benefits when it comes to being public about your refugee hiring efforts. So we encourage you to also share the efforts that you're putting in on social media and in press opportunities. If you have any speaking opportunities um, within your industries um, to be able to really share the work that you're doing as a really meaningful DEI effort and through company events as well. Next slide. So now that we've talked through ways to set an internal strategy, next we wanna talk through a few ways that companies can actually start developing a refugee recruitment pipeline um, with a few tangible next steps. Uh, next slide, please. The first thing you'll want to do is to be able to identify locations to pilot these refugee hiring efforts. So really looking closely at the specific sites that your company has to be able to start these efforts. Um, generally, we see companies starting with one to three pilot locations to really be able to understand the way um, your organization is responding to um, setting up a refugee hiring program and work closely with those different locations. And then once you're able to successfully do that, you can expand out from there. For companies in Illinois, we do recommend um, looking at locations in the Chicago metro area um, for a number of reasons. Um, and we'll talk more about these later as well, but um, in this area, there is more access to public transportation, as well as the possibility of finding team members that might speak other languages than English that can help communicate with potential refugee employees as well. For those of you outside the Chicago metro area, um, there are opportunities outside of Chicago. Um, so we encourage you also 
um, to just think about a couple of different factors that might make a successful pilot location, namely around transportation and language barriers. Next slide, please. Once you've decided on the locations that you'll be piloting these efforts, the next thing you want to do is understand the roles that you'll be recruiting refugees for. At Tent, we encourage companies to hire for a multitude of roles um, to be able to hire refugees. Refugees are arriving with a range of skills, experience, and background um, that they'll be able to really add to your company. Um, but to also understand where that ref where refugee employees might be the most successful at your company and really integrating into your company's culture. Um, again, for those of you that are able to join Tent, we're also happy to advise on where similar companies have been successful, but knowing that there are a couple of industries on the call like manufacturing. Um, we have seen that there are great opportunities in warehouse or factory roles for refugees with limited language ability to be able to really closely integrate um, into your company's culture and grow from there. Next slide. Once you identify the uh, locations and roles that refugees will fill, the next step is to start building strong partnerships with local organizations that can connect your company directly to refugee talent. There are a number of organizations across uh, Chicago and broader, more broadly in Illinois that are working directly with refugees to help place them in job opportunities and really get their start um, in their career in the United States. You'll hear more from the Cook County Workforce Partnership about how employers can connect um, to refugee populations in the Chicago metro area. Um, and beyond these opportunities, we also encourage you to research where there are local resettlement agencies um, that can help connect your company to refugee talent. These resettlement agencies are the organizations that are tasked by the federal government to help refugees acclimate to life in the United States and help them find work. Um, and so they'll be really important partners um, in your journey to um, be able to start hiring refugees. And as you connect with any organizations, whether they're refugee resettlement agencies or um, different types of organizations, we encourage all companies to really come prepared to these uh, conversations with you know, the jobs description, so really, what is the nature of the job that you're hiring for, information on salary and benefits, as well as some really specific information about English language ability, transportation assistance, and opportunity for growth within your company. Next slide. And as you continue connecting with these organizations, we encourage all companies to really think carefully about your um, recruitment processes to make sure that you're removing any unnecessary barriers to the process to your processes. We encourage companies as they go through the process to make sure that um, you're not um, canceling people out because of their gaps in their resume, lack of experience in the United States, or seeing even sometimes we hear that ref refugees might seem overqualified for a role. These are all individuals that are coming from a different local business culture and really acclimating to life in the United States while learning um, what the business culture is here. And so we encourage you to really assess a candidate's potential for the role, not necessarily their specific interviewing skills in that moment. Um, I'm going to ask my colleague, Yaron, to put um, a link to our Employer's Guide for Fostering Inclusion for Refugees in the Workplace. This is one of our public guides and a really great resource for companies that are looking to find ways to be um, culturally inclusive during the interview, recruitment, and even onboarding process. And you'll find some great best practices from companies that have done this really, uh, done great work on this as well. Uh, next slide, please. Throughout the process, it is very likely that you are going to um, see some language and cultural barriers come out throughout the interview process. And there are a number of ways that companies can address these head on. The first step is to really examine the roles that you're hiring for to understand what the specific English language requirement really is for that role. Oftentimes you'll see companies, um, especially, especially in um, sectors like the manufacturing space, have concerns about communication um, in those first few weeks of the job, security or safety concerns, um, to be able to know that people can understand uh, proper procedures. Um, and if you put on a job description that English is needed, it might inadvertently screen out a number of people who have elementary English skills, but maybe aren't as conversational in English yet. So it is really important to specify what is needed in English and what has some flexibility um, in terms of your workplace. Um, in terms of cultural differences, we encourage you to also be mindful that there are a number of different communication styles in local business cultures. Um, and most of those um, are ways that companies can really expand their view of what professionalism can look like in the workplace. 
So if someone comes in and they're not making eye contact or there are gender and age dynamics that um, don't seem as familiar, we just encourage you to keep an open mind that someone might just be coming from um, a different sense of what the business culture looks like. And if there are specific requirements for your company to just make sure that you're being upfront about those as well. Next slide, please. The last major barrier that we did wanna cover was considering transportation barriers um, that might affect the ways um, that your um, potential refugee employees are able to get to work. Refugees are not arriving with a driver's license um, or a car. So oftentimes, especially in the initial uh, months um, in the United States, they're going to need to rely on public transportation or company-sponsored transportation to be able to get to work. For those of you in the Chicago metro area, this might even just mean finding where there might be a local bus route or a metro line nearby and making that explicit throughout the interview process. And for those of you outside of the Chicago area, we know that there are bus routes that do run. Um, so if your business is near one of those, that can be a great opportunity to just showcase through the interview process that there is a means for folks to be able to get to work. Next slide, please. So now that we've talked about ways to set an internal strategy and also develop a refugee recruitment pipeline, I'm gonna pass it back to your own to talk a bit about ways that companies can create a welcoming environment for refugee employees. Thanks, Sarah. And, and we know from the, the poll up top that most of your um, companies have yet to hire um, refugees, but did just want to preview a few things to have on your radar that once you actually do hire a refugee employee, here are a couple of best practices to be thinking about, about how to create a welcoming environment for them. So next slide, please. The first thing that you're going to want to think about um, is setting up a refugee-specific um, onboarding program. For many of the refugees who you'll hire, this is going to be their first job in the United States, and so they aren't necessarily going to be familiar with American workplace norms, American benefits, and, and, the, and the experience of working at an American company. So you're really going to want to make sure that you're tailoring your onboarding experience for refugee employees to make sure that they have a good sense of the expectations of them as an employee um, and that they're really being set up for success in their first 90 days um, on the job. So a couple of very tactical ways that you can do that, you can think about setting up a buddy program for refugee employees where they get matched with um, a buddy at the company who speaks their language, who can really walk them through the different resources that a company has, especially around company benefits. You can set up orientation sessions with HR to make sure that they have an opportunity to ask questions about the expectations of them as an employee at your company. And you can also think about um, translating key onboarding materials into the refugee's native language to make sure that they're catching all of those nuances. I think we can all appreciate that starting a job at a new company is challenging for all of us. And so you're going to want to have that extra level of touch and engagement with, um, with these individuals to make sure that they have a positive experience in their first few months. Next slide, please. You're also going to want to start thinking about um, how you can support the professional development of your refugee employees. One thing that we know is that um, refugees are often very grateful for the opportunity to work at a company that creates a welcoming environment for them and often have higher retention rates than the average employee. And so they're planning on, many of them will plan to stay at your company for a long time. And so you as a, as a, as a employer really want to be thinking about how are you going to be investing in their professional growth? And so that is both thinking about what existing programming does your company offer to support all of your employees and making sure that your refugee employees know about those benefits, like any college classes or credentialing or training that you offer to your employees and making sure refugees are aware of those. And then thinking about what additional resources could you potentially offer to your refugee employees to supplement that. So maybe you create, uh, again, a buddy or a mentorship program internally for your refugee employees, or you invest in English language classes to support them, to help them quickly learn English so they can grow at your company. Next slide, please. And then you're also going to want to be thinking about how do you create a more culturally inclusive workplace for your refugee employees to make sure that they feel welcomed um, in, in their in, with their full selves in your workplace. And so um, a couple of ways to think about doing that is one, thinking about um, making sure that they have time off for their cultural and religious holidays. Often people from other parts of the world will celebrate different holidays than, than, um, than Americans. And so making sure that they um, uh, know that they can take time off for those. And similarly, making sure that they have culturally appropriate food options. A good example of that is that if you've hired a practicing Muslim, 
Muslim um, uh, refugee employee, you'll want to make sure that they have halal food um, available. And then similarly, just making sure that your employee, to what we were shared earlier, really has a good understanding of U.S. workplace norms, given that many of them are, are, are this is going to be their first job in the United States. And so really making sure that they get training or have a buddy who can really help them better understand kind of uh, what it's like to work at a company in the United States. And really from, from this very small details that many of us take for granted um, with our understanding of um, American culture. Um, next slide, please. And so now that we've kind of highlighted a few kind of best practices for welcoming environment, to how to create a welcoming environment for refugee employees, we now want to talk just through some 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 next steps for how you continue to drive impact moving um, forward. So next slide, please. So one of the key things that we think is really essential when you're setting up and implementing a refugee hiring program is actually being able to track the number of refugees you both interviewed and hired. And this is so essential in order to assess the effectiveness of your refugee hiring um, engagement. So let's say you've interviewed 100 refugees and only hired one of them. You're going to want to understand what's going, what's what's breaking down in that interview process, and how could you better kind of um, engage with this with this um, employee base um, uh, in the interview process. On the flip side, let's say you've hired 20 refugee employees at one site and it's going really well, and you're seeing that they're having a really making really wonderful contributions for your business. You're also going to want to be able to track that so that then you can make the business case to your leadership that they should be investing more in this population. And so tracking really becomes essential to understand the successes and challenges of this business. And companies can track the number of refugees hired in a number of ways. Usually the easiest way is actually through the application materials so that when you are asking individuals about their, um, asking them questions about uh, that you typically would ask all of your employees around and applicants around diversity and inclusion, you can include a question there about whether they identify as a refugee and holds a status like refugee or asylum seeker or temporary protected status holder. And then very similarly, if you don't do that as part of the application material, you can always do that as part of your employee engagement surveys. So again, adding in a question around how they whether they identify as a refugee, so that you're really collecting this information and can continue to drive impact forward. And then you, as you can see on the next slide, once you've set up an effective um, program in um, Chicago or in Illinois, um, as you can see on the next slide, we really encourage you to think about um, how to choose scale this um, program to other parts of the country as well. Chicago is hosting a large number of refugees, but so are many other cities um, across the country. And for companies that are interested in joining TENT who meet our size thresholds, we can really work with you to identify um, other parts of the country where it makes sense to focus your refugee hiring efforts, where you have large hiring needs and there's a large refugee population um, close by. So um, uh, as you can see on the next slide, um, we would be really thrilled for any company that has over 2,000 employees to um, join TENT and reach out to us. As you can see on the next slide, our, um, uh, here are our emails. We'll also put them in the chat. So feel free to um, reach out to us. And then for companies who don't meet our site's thresholds, please rely on some wonderful resources in Illinois that we've been sharing in the chat on our publicly available resources and hope that all of your companies will step up at this really critical moment for refugee integration and start hiring from this population. Thank you so much and, and I look forward to hearing questions later. Thanks, Jerome. Thanks, Sarah. Um, if folks have questions right now for them, please put them in the chat so that we're sure to ask them at the end. Um, that was great information. You also gave us all so much to think about. We really appreciate your partnership on this webinar. I'm now going to turn it over to Victor Vizueta from the partnership. The Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership operates the public workforce system in the city of Chicago and Cook County. Away, Victor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Bisueta, Business Relations Specialist um, at the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present um, our business service tools and the information that we are doing for the new arrivals. Next slide. So we prepare a brief agenda about the items that we're going to cover today. We're gonna um, do an overall about what the partnership is all about. Um, also about the business relations and economic development team, um, the business services and solutions that we have available, information about the new arrivals. Next slide, please. 
So the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership is the umbrella organization uh, that represents the public workforce system for the city of Chicago and Cook County. We have been in operation for um, over 10 years and we are the largest one in the nation. The partnership has um, served the two major clients that we have, which are the job seekers and employers. Uh, we had assisted over 60,000 individuals find employment and we have assisted over 2,000 employers in the area to connect with the job seekers. Uh, we, uh, thanks to the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, we are able to serve um, this population, the job seekers and employers in the area. We have administered over $200 million in federal and uh, philanthropic fundings, and we are located all through Cook County. We have 53 community-based organizations and 10 American job centers. In addition, we got four uh, sector-driven workforce centers that serves a total of 132 municipalities. And according to the labor, uh, to the region labor market information, these are the main industries or sectors that we are currently serving. Um, the, the partnership um, has plenty of partners um, they help us assist um, with the job seekers and, and employers. Here is our contact information. I believe it's also mentioned at the end, uh, but we are definitely looking forward to connect with you. Next slide. Now regarding the business relations and economic development team, uh, we are the connectors between both the employers and the people they are ready to work. So just yes, so we understand uh, the way that the, the public workforce system is, we'll, we'll meet our clients where they are. And, and for job seekers, if they are in requirement of training, we'll provide them with training resources and other support services. And for employers, we got business service solutions. And of course, our main goal is to connect them with this uh, uh, work ready talent that we have available to WIOA. So here's a link to the services employers that we have. Um, if you can please go to the next slide. Here is a snapshot of uh, the business relations and economic development team. Our leader is Kathleen Brannigan. She is the break director. In addition, she is also overseeing the healthcare industry and the healthcare sector center. Um, here's my contact information. My industry is information technology and professional services. And I'm also assisting with the new arrival initiative, very important for the region to assist uh, new immigrants to find employment and other resources in the area. Uh, my other colleagues are Tanya Curry Robinson, Pat Patricia Moore, uh, Miriam Beatty, and Pamela Thomas. As you can see, we do have all major industries represented in here. You know, um, if there is something that we can do for you, you can connect to either one of us or um, you can send me your information and I can refer them to the appropriate industry. Next slide. Regarding the business services that we um, have available, this is um, just a brief list of all the different things that we do um, for businesses. We provide hiring events, job fairs, and virtual job fairs. Uh, we can provide labor market information. Uh, we share and post job openings through our databases. We provide industry specific sector centers. Uh, the four sectors are transportation, distribution, and logistics, information technology, hospitality, and healthcare. And then we're gonna be discussing briefly the business service solutions that we have available um, and see potential ways that we can connect with each other. Uh, in addition to that, we provide um, employers with grants and we can connect it to other partners and programs as well. Next slide, please. Um, now the business service solutions, one, um, one of them are on the gap training on the job training is a uh, hiring program that can provide some uh, reimbursement funding for the wages for those participants. And this is for new employees of a company. If your company is in need of hiring, 
uh, new employees, um, we can definitely work with you and provide you with some uh, ready, ready to work talent. But if they are in addition in need of training, we can do an on the job training for them. And you as an employer can receive reimbursement up to $10,000 per uh, full-time employee. It's one of the most uh, popular business services solutions, I might add, that we have um, here in the region. Next slide. Incumbent worker training is designed to uh, train and retrain the existing employees of a company. Um, something very important regarding incumbent worker training is that um, as many of our other training services solutions is a reimbursement program, the difference is that this program can uh, potentially be up to 100% reimbursement. So if your company has existing employees that um, are in need of training, uh, we can definitely work with you. You will select the training that you need. You will select the number of participants that you do, um, that you send to the training. You select the training provider, trainer provider. So, and we can offset the cost of that training and enforcement reimbursement. Next slide. Customized training is yet another business service solutions that we have. There is a special uh, requirement from an employer. Um, when an employer has a certain new system or a new tool that they want to provide training on, they can either um, work on training some of the existing employees or they can, um, they can be part of the organization of that customized training where they will decide who, um, who will they want people to be trained and then when they hire them um, full time, um, they will already have the skills that they need to perform that job. So um, again, another popular business service tool, the reimbursement, the potential reimbursement for that program can be up to 50% of the training cost. Next slide. Now, um, if your company is willing to um, train participants, but it's not in the capacity of hiring somebody full-time or part-time. There is a pay work experience, another business service tools. Well, um, the public workforce system will pay for the training up to a certain number of hours. And um, you as an employer will receive the benefits for having somebody um, on your staff that will be working and providing the training and knowledge to that person that might be new to that industry or sector. So it's 100% coverage of the participant wages. And then it can be um, a, an, initial, an initial part of um, the different business service tools that we can offer. Um, I always mention to my colleagues that uh, we can do more than one business service solutions to an employer. There is employers that um, definitely look at the public workforce system as, as, a, as a matter of uh, providing them with the resources they need. And that's what we're here for, to provide those resources. So, so an employer, you can have somebody be in a pay work experience and then they can hire that person full time and benefit for an OJT and receive reimbursement for having that new employee um, for the training portion of those new wages. And in addition to that, after that person has been uh, employed for a few months, you can complement that with an incoming worker training project. So definitely there is ways that, that we can work with you and a different um, on the different areas or needs that you have as your business. And as I mentioned earlier, we do have um, other resources that we can provide to you as a public workforce system. Next slide. Apprenticeship um, is an industry-driven high-quality career pathway. So, and again, this is an employer-driven um, initiative where if you want to provide um, a career um, that can lead to um, stackable credentials for the employees and participants, uh, apprenticeship is something that you as a company should look into it. 
um, is something that is expanding all through the U.S. And certainly here in Illinois, we're, we're looking more into apprenticeships. As we do the other business service solutions, we want to expand with um, apprenticeship as well. I will also add that the business service solutions that I mentioned earlier, such as OJT and Income and Worker Training, um, can be part of apprenticeship as well. So as you can see, everything is related and um, it is possible to access more of, of one of the services that we have as, as a system. Next slide. I believe, yes, this slide has the contact, in, um, the contact for the different resources for apprenticeships. Um, there was a boot camp that happened um, last year where we have some information. There is a lot of great materials provided um, from that um, event last year. And um, there is currently a talent pipe management uh, training. The materials are in here as well. And of course, there is funding opportunities and there are plenty of resources for apprenticeship. Um, apprenticeship is, um, is a great services that you can do for your, um, when you want to not only um, expand your services that you have for your employees, but they can also provide a lot of great resources for them. Um, when, if retention is an issue or finding the right talent and cultivating the skills of those new employees um, is an issue for your company, we can definitely look into apprenticeships and ways to offset some of those uh, barriers for employment in some of those areas. Next slide. Regarding the new arrivals, um, so we have, uh, we do have a presence in the federal building where the new arrivals um, attend to work on the documentation they need. Um, so the new arrivals are doing the temporary protective status or the TPS, and then doing the employment authorization um, documentation or EAD, I believe the acronym is. So um, we have served uh, or we have collected information from um, over 1,700 uh, people. They have um, they have attended this event at uh, the federal building. So we have also in communications with uh, 22 of the shelters for the new arrivals. We have collected this information because as a public workforce system, we want to serve them. And once, um, right now, one of the main asks for them is, as it was mentioned earlier, um, I believe over 90% are looking for um, English services or English classes. So we are connecting them with our, our different resources that we have available um, so they can access um, those English courses or English training. Now, um, many of them are already starting to receive their employment authorization. So the next phase for us is to invite them for um, a series of events that we want to have, and more specifically, um, next week, um, Wednesday, we are going to have a, a resource fair that's going to take place at Malcolm X College. We want to purposely invite those they have their work permit of they have come through the information we collected and we invited them to attend the resource fair. And again, we want to provide them with the resources. We are we have um, close to 20 or over 20 already confirmed uh, different organizations that will be on site providing resources to this community. And in addition to that, we will have um, we will have an employer champion that will be providing some of the workshops for the job seekers. And um, as a result of the resource fair, our vision is to uh, prepare them um, with resume and the workshops and the documentation they need so they can attend a hiring event. So we are also planning a hiring event on March 19. It's gonna take place at the same place, Malcolm X College. They have great, uh, graciously provided us with the uh, location and they're one of our partners. So we want to have a hiring event and we want representation from different uh, industries. 
um, they wants to hire the new arrivals. There is an, an employer interest form link uh, that is gonna be provided through the PowerPoint and I believe it's gonna be in the chat as well. So those employers that are interested in participating is a free event. Uh, we will prepare uh, the job seekers and we can provide the resources and tools that you need for, um, for the hiring event. We will have other events and we'll follow up with those employers. Um, you know, they are interested, but they may not attend the March 19 event. We can definitely work one-on-one -on -one as the public workforce system, again, through our American Job Centers or through the partnership or through our partner agencies and connecting with um, the new arrivals. There is plenty of opportunities um, to connect the dots and we'll, we'll make sure that they will have those conversations um, so we can serve you better. Next slide. This is just our um, information so you can connect uh, with me or with anyone on our teams. Again, um, the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership is a public workforce system. And um, I'm sure we have uh, many of my colleagues. I, I saw some of the names earlier. I'm happy to see um, some of my partners uh, be here today. Is there, there any questions at any time? Please let me know. Uh, we are here to serve you and provide the resources that you need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. That was great. Um, we now have time for questions. Um, I know that some people could only stay for the hour, so we have lost a few people, but two things I'll mention. One is that questions and answers have been happening during this entire webinar, both in the chat and in the Q&A, which you can access in the bottom bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, the second thing I will say is we know there's a lot of questions about different statuses um, and things related to that. Um, thank you, um, your own and Sarah for doing some clarification based on your knowledge and expertise. Um, we will make sure that any Q&As that have already come up um, or ones we can't answer today will be included in the follow-up information. Um, thank you also to a number of the participants in this webinar for sharing resources um, that you have in the chat, and we will include those in the follow-up um, resources that go out to folks. Um, but Kelly, do you mind um, flagging any questions that might remain unanswered for us? We might want to ask, sorry, Kelly, I didn't mean to step on your toes. We might want to ask Yaron and Sarah, there was a couple great question and answers in the chat. If you would like to address any of those kind of in a summary, especially around language, that'd be a great way to start. And then Kelly can read any of the other questions. Thank you. So in terms of language barriers, as we highlighted in our presentation, it's one of the main challenges that refugees um, face um, when integrating into American society. And so, for example, if you were to attend the event that Victor mentioned on March 19th, most of those individuals are going to be Spanish speakers with pretty limited English language proficiency. And so you're really going to want to be thinking about the types of roles that refugees um, could fill um, at your business that don't require um, English language proficiency, where they can learn English on the job and then take on additional responsibility as time goes. We have a, um, a really great guidebook that I put in the chat earlier about how companies can address language barriers for refugee employees. So I highly recommend taking a look at that as well. Thanks. What other questions are there? I'm just looking through. I think we fielded a, most of the questions. Um, let me just glance through. The one that I think would be helpful is suggestions for small businesses or entrepreneurs aside from reaching out to community organizations. Are there other avenues? And possibly Victor can speak to this um, or Kelly or Carrie about what are other avenues for smaller businesses or entrepreneurs that are available within the state? Uh, yeah, so um, actually we we definitely um, love to partner with uh, with small businesses. We we even um, 
We even provide, you know, one-on-one -on -one services to them. I know that for small businesses, um, you know, sometimes a chart um, is very small or non-existing in some cases. So we can definitely can help them all the way from providing a uh, creating, helping them creating my job descriptions to having a one-on-one -on -one, um, hiring event just for that small employer to the closest location that we have on site. We can do some pre-screening and we can provide definitely uh, many, many of the services that we have small businesses qualify for most, if not all of the services that I mentioned earlier. Did that answer the question? Yes, thank you. I also I think, just wanted, oh, go ahead, Kelly, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna add, um, I'm gonna drop a link in the chat to adult education providers. Um, it's a centralized link. I know there was a couple questions that came through about, um, ESL classes for English language learners and, and resources like that. So it is on the centralized landing page that was developed for uh, new arrivals, um, but I'll go ahead and drop that as a separate separate link here. Thanks. There was also a question about whether did we have confirmation from DOL that people who have their TPS status can get served through, can get enrolled in WIOA Title I. And that was confirmed. So that's in the chat, but I want to just say that. Um, and also, while people are waiting for their TPS um, or employment authorization, the public workforce system can provide basic career services. So. Um, things that frequently don't provide, uh, require enrollment, things that IDS um, assists with. So we should make sure that we're doing that. Um, any other questions that are outstanding? Okay. Um, uh, a couple of things. We will, so again, all the resources that have been shared in the chat by partners, et cetera, um, uh, as well as everything that we've mentioned will be included in follow-up materials. There's likely to be two follow-ups, one uh, uh, immediately or semi-immediately with the recording and the slides. So you'll have all the links that are in the slides. The second will be all the Q&A information and other resources. It'll just take us probably a little bit longer to compile all that. Um, we are currently planning to also have this information available on one of the websites that we've created on this topic. Um, so it's not gonna, if you lose it in your email, you should be able to find it otherwise. Um, then I do wanna just say thank you so much to the Tent Partnership, um, to Victor and the partnership team that's really leading all the efforts uh, locally at the workshops to Kelly and the team, to Amy and the, all the logistics for this. Um, we do, there are three action steps that we're just focused on right now for anybody who wants to get started. One, find an American Job Center contact near you from the service locator. The second is please complete, if you're in Cook County, the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnerships Employer Interest Form. Um, and then if, um, uh, please reach out to your own or Sarah if you'd like to work with TENT. Um, so, and also just a final thank you for everyone who participated. We had over 350 registrants. There are about 200 people on today. Um, so we're really excited to work with all of you and really excited about the commitment to making a successful transition into employment for so many people who need help. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. So we have one final poll that we're going to launch and then we will do that. Um, you'll also have an evaluation link with the slide deck and the resources that we'll be sharing out and that pulls up. So please take a second. There are multiple questions on it. So we'll, five questions, we'll give an opportunity to answer those. And then thank you very much for your time today.